everyone, Shannon here with Journey to Peace and today I want to talk about love. So Valentine's Day was yesterday and leading up to the celebration of love, I was seeing heart-shaped ads, suggestions of how to celebrate my love for my significant other, and of course posts from friends and family about how they would be celebrating their love for each other. And this just made me think back to the course I took from Yale on the science of well-being. In that course, through case studies and research, they essentially debunk our traditional ideas around what we think will make us happy, um, like making more money and falling in love. But that course shows that while there's a spike in our overall happiness in the first years of marriage, our happiness essentially goes back to neutral. And this is also actually the case uh, with the compensation after a certain monetary benchmark. But we can save that for another time. So as I observed the love in the air yesterday and as I read couples social media love letters to each other, I started thinking, what is love? Much like our emotions and thoughts, we can't touch it. It's not really tangible, but we can feel it. So what is it? Where does it come from and why is it that we fall in love with specific people, but not others. I just had a lot of questions. Um, if you have experience with love, you'll know that you can't make someone fall in love with you. And sometimes we love people we didn't even like initially. So why is that? Why can't we control this feeling of infatuation and giddiness that we feel for certain people? Well, there is a biological explanation. When you think back to the person you are head over heels for, you may still feel a flutter in your stomach. This is because when you meet that someone who gives you butterflies, your brain releases dopamine, which enhances the release of testosterone. Dopamine being released is the reason the sky seems a little bluer, your mood is affected, bringing feelings of excitement and happiness. And with testosterone being released, well, that would be why there's an increase in sexual desire as well. Now, here's the fascinating part. Have you ever been so in love that you can't think of anything else but that person? This is because there are two neurotransmitters that are causing you to have focused attention and feelings of giddiness. They are called norepinephrine and PEA. So PEA is the neurotransmitter that is responsible for feelings of giddiness and even a loss of appetite. This is also the culprit that's responsible for your feelings of depression if the relationship doesn't last. Because once those levels fall, it brings with it those feelings of sadness. Okay, so let's get back to the juicy lovey stuff. So we are at the stage of feeling excited and giddy towards this person, and now there's a feedback loop that starts to form in your brain. So basically, the central nervous system is being affected by the neurotransmitters we just talked about, and the nervous system is sending positive messages to the brain's reward system. Basically, it's saying, if you see this person again, you'll receive more of those feelings of excitement and happiness. And interestingly, you can initiate this reward system just by seeing that person's picture or even just by thinking about them. And thus begins the beautiful and exciting circle of being in love. Now, in an article from Harvard University where they break down the three categories of romantic love, I learned the most amazing discovery. In that article, they made a connection between the first stages of attraction and those who have OCD. They say that attraction seems to lead to a reduction in serotonin, which is that hormone that's known to be involved in appetite and mood. 
And people who suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder also have low levels of serotonin. This is leading scientists to speculate that this is what underlies that overpowering infatuation that characterizes the beginning stages of love. So those of you who have experienced this, maybe we're not so different after all. So I would highly recommend checking out Harvard's article about the three categories of love, which I will put in the description below because it is such a good read and they even touch on the friend zone. For anyone who's been put in the friend zone, it's a confusing time for both parties. You may have had the attraction and even the chemistry. Well, then why am I still the go-to guy or gal for love advice for that person that I feel such a romantic connection to? It turns out that attachment is the predominant factor in long-term relationships. So while you may have the first two categories checked off the list, lust and attraction, if you don't have attachment to that person, then it most likely is why you're still picking them up from their late night rendezvous and why you're their shoulder to cry on, but why they're not seeing a future with you. I'm still referring to the friend zone. The chemicals that are responsible for bonding, which will encourage that attachment, are oxytocin. Oxytocin is nicknamed the cuddle hormone. And the other one is called vasopressin. Without those hormones present, you can have the love and lust, but there may not be a long lasting attachment, unfortunately. But hey, maybe it's for the best. In doing my research, while society was telling me I should be writing romantic poems and eating an expensive dinner with my husband, I also stumbled across an article from the Harvard Gazette that explains the ebbs and flows of a relationship. In that article, Jacqueline Olds, a psychiatrist at the Harvard Medical School, is quoted saying, there's too much pressure on what a romantic partner should be. They should be your best friend, they should be your lover, they should be your closest relative, they should be your work partner, they should be the co-parent, your athletic partner, and of course, everybody isn't able to quite live up to it. I love that quote because whether you've been with your partner for 12 years, like me, or you're just now starting out on an exciting new relationship, or if you're still looking for that person who can spike your dopamine levels and flush your brain with norepinephrine, the point is that this is a biological response to someone, and in my opinion, is one of those things that makes life worth living. But once you get into that relationship and form those bonds, remember that it's gonna take work, and your relationship doesn't have to look like everyone else's. It just has to work for you and your boo. Another quote I love from that article is this. What keeps love alive is being able to recognize that you don't really know your partner perfectly and still being curious and still be exploring. So with that said, if you've been in a relationship for a really long time, stay curious and be that person who notices if you're drifting apart so that you can lean back into each other. And if you're just starting out, Enjoy that wonderful excitement and giddiness of new love. And if you haven't found that person just yet, don't sweat it. Those spikes of testosterone and dopamine and lowered levels of serotonin can sometimes come with a price. So if you are single and ready to mingle, just enjoy the ride. And remember that you can always focus on loving yourself, which has been proven to give you a greater sense of happiness and a general well-being. It's a win-win. Okay, thank you so much for watching. I wish you all peace, positivity, and most of all, love today and always. And if you like the content, please be sure to click that subscribe button so that you can receive new videos as they're posted. And if no one's told you today, please know that you are strong, you are loved, and you add something so special to this world. And I, for one, am happy that you're here.